So hello and welcome to this end video course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we're looking at Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. We've had a, a few lectures on this already so we'll just dive into the section that we are uh, aiming to cover today in this lecture. Now if you remember uh, when I stopped in the previous lecture I mentioned a particular term which I thought I'll pick on and uh, just you know expand on in the uh, subsequent lectures and that term was delayed decoding. So we talked about how delayed decoding is a very important uh, narrative technique used by Conrad. So what is delayed decoding? So delayed decoding is that uh, the, the instrument of narration through which the senses uh, appear first, the senses are foregrounded and the object comes much later, the object which creates the senses, the object which creates impressions, uh, the object comes much later, the object is decoded much later and hence the whole idea of delayed decoding. Uh, so for instance, uh, there is a section on how the darkness which you will see and spend some time on where Conrad uh, Marlow who is traveling down Congo, uh, he feels himself completely bombarded by certain things and you know, it, it's pricking on his skin and it's attacking him and he doesn't quite know what the things are. But he gets the impression, the senses, the sense of fear, the sense of you know, the tactile sense of being touched with something alien uh, that appears over and over again and that is foregrounded with very dense descriptions. And only much later do we find out that the objects which are actually causing that are arrows, red arrows that you know are being shot at at Marlow and his, and his steamer. So the object comes much later, it's decoded much later and the impressions and the senses they come much before, much earlier and only through, by navigating through the senses do we reach the object eventually. So the whole idea of delayed decoding on Conrad's narrative style is very important and it's a very important style because it talks about it describes or it foregrounds the density of objects, the density of sensory experience, the, uh, the opacity or rather the translucence uh, of impressions. So what I mean by translucence is the uh, liminal category between transparent and opaque. It's something but, but that we know as well as don't know. So you know there's a degree of unknowability about experience that Conrad excels in, in, in terms of you know, incorporating that into his narrative style. And we see how this becomes very quickly political and racial in quality as well because you know at the end of the day what's happening is the white man is going to a non-white space where everything is alien to him and the whole idea of invading and totalizing the non-white space comes with a fear and anxiety of not knowing what's around him uh, all the time. So you know the whole idea of going to a space of alterity or a different space is important because the difference is foregrounded, the difference is dramatized with the whole idea of delayed decoding, right? We don't quite know what the objects are, we don't quite know uh, how things shape up around us because this is a politically and racially and culturally different space. And so the, the whole idea of being politically and culturally and materially other uh, informs the whole existential awareness of otherness, right? And that is part of the uh, unknowability which informs delayed decoding. Okay, so uh, so the section that is on your screen at the moment, this is where Marlow was uh, sailing onto Congo in a steamer, and then this is what he says, and this should be on the screen. Every day the course looked the same, as though we had not moved, but we passed various various places, trading places with names such as Grand Bissau, Little Popo, names that seemed to belong to some sordid farts acted in front of a sinister black cloth. Right, so uh, they're passing on different petty places, little petty ports. Uh, but it seems to Marlow that they're not moving at all. There's a degree of stillness and immobility uh, about the whole experience. Uh, you know, he's uh, in a boat, it doesn't seem to move at all, but he's passing on different places uh, with very, very strange names. And we take a look at the politics of naming, Grand Bassam and Little Popo. Uh, these obviously are ad hoc names given by European companies. Uh, and sometimes the logic, the rationale behind these names might be ludicrous. Uh, so, you know, the whole idea, the whole falsity of naming those places with European names is something that Marlow uh, is experiencing very early on in his encounter with imperialism. The whole politics of naming places, the whole politics of giving names to places which otherwise are unknown. And the, like I said, the rationale behind naming those places might be ludicrous at certain points. It might be a product grown in that particular place. It might be a company uh, or name of a company official who acts in that particular place. And these are the rationales that inform namings for such places, which are often ludicrous in quality. Okay, the idleness of the passenger, my isolation amongst all these men with whom I had no point of contact, seemed to keep me away from the truth 
of things. So again, the whole idea of being away from the truth of things is important because that's what I mean when I, when I mention the term the density of experience, the density of uh, experientiality, right? That you know, every experience in Conrad is very dense in quality and that is reflected in the density of descriptions. So if you know by now, I should, you should be knowing the Heart of Darkness is a very dense novel to read. So if you read a novel, it's more of a novella than a novel, it's barely 90 pages uh, long. But it will take you a lot of time to read it because it's not a novel that you can quickly consume. You know, it's not that kind of a novel. It's a novel which will test your patience. It's a novel which will test your reading ability because of the density of descriptions. It's very, very dense, ontologically very dense, uh, you know, narratively it's very, very dense, um, uh, etc. So the whole idea of being away from the truth of things that Marlowe is experiencing and that gets extended or spilled over uh, even the real experience when reading Heart of Darkness, we, we don't quite know what's happening all the time. So we do like Marlowe, we are away from the truth of things. So uh, although this is a retrospective narration, Marlowe obviously knows the truth now. But the way he is uh, re-narrating it, uh, you know, narration on Heart of Darkness is also an act of re-experiencing. So he's giving you the flavor of the first-hand experience in that sense, um, the experience that he first had when he went to Congo. He's not telling you what it, it is now exactly because obviously he knows the things now because it's been through it. But he's making us the readers go into the same experience, the same experience pattern that he went through as well. Okay, so the whole idea of being away from the truth of things is important over here. So even as a narrator, even as a reader, uh, you are experiencing the whole fact of being away from the truth of things. Okay, within a toil of a mournful and senseless delusion, delusion about the meaning of things, delusion about the whole you know, idea of imperialism, etc. The voice of the surf head now and then was a positive pleasure, like the speech of a brother. It was natural that it had its reason that had a meaning. Now and then a boat from the shore gave one a momentary contact with reality. So the whole idea of reality and meaningfulness become a luxury uh, to Marlowe because you know they're stranded in the middle of nowhere. You know, it's, they almost feel as if they're not moving at all uh, in the middle of nowhere in this endless fluidity of the sea. Uh, so the surf, the surf head every now and then, you know, when the waves are breaking, the surf head is generated. Every now and then the visibility of the surf head is a, is a you know, nourishing break. It's something which gives some meaning and every time a boat comes in from the shore, it uh, gives you a momentary contact with reality which we otherwise you know, don't have uh, in the middle of this vast ocean that Marlowe is stranded in, in a steamer. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> and then he goes on to say, uh, for a time I would feel I belong still to a world of straightforward facts, but the feeling would not last long. So the whole idea of moving away from straightforward facts is important and that's actually commentary on the whole novel so to say because this is a novel which doesn't really deal with straightforward facts anymore right because you know it's, it's a departure from facts, it's a departure from reality, palpable reality, tangible reality. It's, a, a, it's an entrance into a, a world of meanings uh, where you know meanings are always produced and reproduced and deproduced right so it's about deproduction of meanings uh, to a large extent. Right, so it's a long uh, way away from uh, straightforward facts and this whole departure from straightforward facts is important because what that tells us is that straightforward facts as we know it are cultural constructs to a large extent. They, they, those come from a certain cultural setting, those come from a certain meaning landscape, meaningful landscapes. When you take away the landscape, when you take away the materiality of the meaningful landscape, when you're in the middle of nowhere, those facts don't matter at all. Those facts um, cease to have any meaning whatsoever. So. In a nutshell, what Marlowe tells us, uh, what we get, uh, the sense that we get away here is the, the very interesting entanglement between material reality and experientiality. The way you experience things depends on the material reality around you. So the reality around you is something that is familiar to you, uh, something that you can navigate with, then the whole idea of meaning production and meaning consumption becomes easier and quicker and more linear in quality. However, if the material reality around you changes, that for instance it does over here in Marlowe, in, in the case of Marlowe when he is in the middle of nowhere, when all he has sees around us is, a, is an endless fluidity of the sea, then obviously uh, your whole sense of meaning, your whole grasp of meaning uh, changes as well quite dramatically, then qu you don't quite know how to deal with what is around you all the time. Okay. <clears throat> 
So uh, something would turn up to scare it away. Once I remember, we came upon a man of war anchored off the coast. So this is a very important section. This is the reason why I'm spending some time with this today. A man of war is a shooting vessel. You know, it's one of those vessels. Uh, it's like an artillery machine. It's a gun machine. It's a big gun, which was used uh, presumably by the French at some point in time when they tried to attack this particular uh, landscape. It appears the French had one of the wars going on thereabouts. Her ensign dropped limp like a rag. The muzzles of the long six-inch guns stuck out all over the low hull. The greasy, slimy swell uh, swung upon her, and swung her up lazily and let her down, sewing her thin mass. So this is a description of a machine, but also look at the way in which how the machine is humanized as a, as a female figure. So the man of war is basically a machine gun. It was a French machine gun which was left uh, abandoned. Uh, supposedly, uh, because the French had some war in that region and then moved on, and for some reason that, that particular ammunition they got left behind. It was, uh, you know, uh, abandoned. It's an abandoned ammunition. Uh, but then the way it's described the way is almost humanized, right? And uh, this is interesting because what it's actually telling us is that this is a situation, this is a cultural climate where everything is commodified, everything becomes a machine. Uh, so conversely, every machine becomes humanized as well, right? So this whole borderline between what is human and what is non-human, what is a machine, what is an organic reality. Uh, the borderlines blur away very, very quickly because we find uh, the French, uh, you know, machine gun away, uh, the man of war away, uh, is almost, um, there's almost an empathetic gaze that Marlowe has on it, right? It's almost like Marlowe feels for its abandoned uh, condition. Marlowe feels for its alienation, the fact that it doesn't have any meaning anymore. And that seems to have some kind of a resonance with the way he's experiencing reality as well, as an outsider, as an Englishman who is in the middle of nowhere now. So he feels abandoned as well. He feels uh, uh, alienated as well. He feels exhausted of meaning as well, just like the uh, French ammunition over here, the abandoned ammunition over here. So that, that man-machine empathy over here is very interesting and something that uh, How the Darkness does touch upon every now and then. Okay, uh, and then see how this French ammunition, this abandoned, would still, I mean, obviously it's dysfunctional, but every now and then it'll pop and, and fire something, uh, you know, because no one bothered to stop it, no one bothered to dominate it, really. So it's an abandoned machine gun which will pop up um, and give empty fires every now and then. And this is the description that's coming up for you, this should be on the screen. Uh, in the empty immensity of earth, sky, and water, there she was, incomprehensible, firing into a continent. So, you know, it just continued to fire, uh, you know, emptily, endlessly, meaninglessly, and purposelessly. So, you know, the whole purposelessness of the firing mechanism over here becomes a very symbolic signifier of the purposelessness of imperialism to a large, a large extent, right? Pop would one go, would go one of the six inch guns. A small flame would dart and vanish, a little white smoke would disappear, a tiny projectile would give a feeble screech and nothing happened. So again, this particular sentence is very, very important. Pop go, would go one of the six inch guns. So again, one of the guns would go pop out every now and then. Uh, and a small flame would dart and vanish. So, you know, it just continued to fire, it just continued to, to sort of function in a very, very dysfunctional way. And uh, there's something very, uh, Sisyphean about this whole ex exercise, uh, something completely purposeless about this whole exercise, uh, meaningless about this whole exercise. Why is an obvious question, why the necessity to fire? A little white smoke would disappear, a tiny projectile would give a feeble screech and nothing happened. And this last, this last bit is important over here, nothing happened. Following sentence, nothing could happen, right? So the sense of nothingness is important. So what is produced? out of this image, what is produced out of this operation was nothingness, right? So the whole idea, the whole French uh, uh, man in armor way, the whole French machine gun, the abandoned ammunition way, uh, it becomes a symbol of the production of nothingness, right? Quite literally and quite symbol uh, sim symbolically, it becomes the production of nothingness, an endless production and reproduction of nothingness. And that in a way, uh, according to Marlowe, some sub imperialism. That, you know, in the end, it's actually about nothingness. It's about man's greed. It's, it's about man's exploitation. It's about all the vices the man is capable of. But then, at the end, it's about nothingness. It's about there's something very nihilistic, uh, something very negative and self consuming, cannibalistic about imperialism that, uh, that Marlowe would describe. But this first image, the, the first signifier of nothingness, the first signifier of purposelessness, the first symbol of purposelessness and how the darkness is important for us to understand. That's why we're spending some time away here. 
you know, the long machine guns, which are there in the French ammunition, which is abandoned. It had some meaning at some point in time in history, but now time has moved on and left it behind with no sense of purpose. And all it does every now and then is pop up little guns, pop up little fires and it keeps firing into the continent. It doesn't kill anything, doesn't serve any purpose, but just keeps firing over and over again ad infinitum. And its ad infinitum quality is precisely what makes it so nihilistic in quality, it makes it so negative in quality. Right, so nothing happened, nothing could happen. It's almost like a Beckettian ring about this. So those of you who read Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot would know this is a phrase which uh, keeps coming up. Nothing happened, or nothing happens twice, nothing happens over and over again. So what it actually means is uh, nothingness is produced. So you know, the whole idea of happening is reduced to a nothingness. So nothingness is happening all the time. And then Marlowe goes on to say, there's a touch of insanity in the proceeding, a sense of uh, lugubrious drollery in the sight. And again, look at the way Conrad, uh, Marlowe and Conrad, uh, they, they're very dense in the descriptions. There's a density in the words. There's a degree of uh, difficulty in description, which is uh, important for us to recognize. And part of the difficulty is connected to another term, which I'll spend some time with today. Uh, it's related to delayed decoding, but it's also a little different. And that is a term called defamiliarization. So what is defamiliarization? Defamiliarization as a term is a technique through which the world that is familiar to you is dramatically defamiliarized. Right? So the way it's described, the way it appears, the way it's experienced, uh, it generates a sense of alienation, a sense of cognitive alienation. As a result of which, the familiar world, the familiar furniture uh, of meanings around you, that changes to an extent that it becomes completely different and alienated. Like, like for instance, the, the, the the furniture around it. It could be, um, you know, literally a furniture. It could be a piece of chair. It could be a wooden desk. Uh, but it, it could also be more symbolic things. Now, the way it's described, the way it's experienced by the subject, uh, it, it generates a sense of uh, alienation. It generates a sense of meaninglessness. It generates a sense of dissonance, uh, cognitive dissonance, uh, and that dissonance is important. And that is what defamiliarization is all about. Right, it is a world which is defamiliarized before you. So, we have a machine gun over here, which should be a very familiar object to someone like Marlowe who has traveled so far, so much, so extensively. But the way the machine gun appears, the way the ammunition appears over here, uh, you know, it's so defamiliarizing. It's about purposelessness, it's about meaninglessness, it's about alienation. So, it becomes the production of nothingness, and likewise, and by extension, it becomes the production of defamiliarization. And so there's a dual category almost over here. The, these are interconnected categories. Okay, so uh, there's a touch of insanity in the proceeding. Uh, insanity, madness. It is a degree of nothingness, madness, uh, irration irrationality. And you know this is a very important point because imperialism took pride in the fact that this is about um, the European man's rational enterprise. This is about the expansionist enterprise of enlightenment, rationalism, etc. But Malu is taking a look at the dark on the belly of imperialism. It's taking too close a look to know that this is um, an irrational. This is actually highly irrational. And the irrationality of the heart of darkness, the irrationality of imperialism is something which uh, heart of darkness keeps foregrounding over and over again. Uh, and, and that is something which is described, which is reflected in the description, the lugubrious drollery in a sight. So this drollery, the drudgery, uh, the, the laborious quality of the whole enterprise, it just pops up again and then you know, keeps firing and then goes back to sleep and then wakes up and fires again uh, into an empty, dead, dark continent, which doesn't respond to the fire at all. Uh, this is what I meant by the whole idea of Sisyphean quality. It's like a purposeless quality. Sisyphean, of course, is a reference to the myth of Sisyphus, uh, who was consigned uh, to keep pushing up a stone, as uh, most of you know, keep pushing up a stone on top of a hill. And the moment the stone would reach the top of the hill, it would roll down, and Sisyphus was, was doomed to keep pushing it forever, right? So it becomes a symbol of, you know, existential uh, purposelessness. And this is what we have over here as well. Okay. It was not dissipated by somebody on board assuring me earnestly there was a camp of natives. He called them enemies, hidden out of sight somewhere. So the whole point is, you know, it is still there because presumably there are some enemies somewhere, uh, but no one quite can see them. They're not invisible enemies, and invisibility is part of the uh, meaninglessness. Uh, you know, uh, you know the whole pointlessness of places which you know supposedly are controlled without any inhabitants becomes very very uh, clear to Marlow. 
and then he goes on to say, we call at some more places with farcical names. And the word farce appears twice already in a very uh, close space of time. And when a writer like Conrad, who is so diligent, who is so careful with language, is repeating a particular term, repeating a particular word, a particular adjective, uh, we need to pay some attention to it. Now, what is farcical? What is the, the quality of a farce? So, the relationship between farce and tragedy is important because tragedy has some grandeur to it. Tragedy has some depth to it. Tragedy has some uh, a degree of you know profundity to it. Farce is basically exhausted tragedy. Uh, farce is liquidated tragedy. Tragedy which has been liquidated at profundity, which has been exhausted at deep. And there is a slightly comic quality about farce. It is a dark comic quality about farce, which can be morbid humor, which can be gallows humor, which is definitely grotesque humor, and sometimes uh, you know quite morbid in that sense as well. But definitely dark humor. Right, so farce is a combination of tragedy and shallow comedy, right? Depthless comedy, and you combine these two categories together, and it produces farce. So it's a very complex cognitive category, farce. So when Malu says that you know there are places with farcical names, what he's actually telling us is he's sort of seeing through uh, the complete irrationality of imperialism, where it's not really a tragic enterprise. It's a tragic as well as a darkly comic enterprise because it's so irrational in quality. It is so meaningless in quality. Okay. So, we call it some more places with farcical names where the merry dance of death and trade goes on. I mean, look at the lovely phrase, dance of death. The merry dance of death and trade goes on. So, there's a dance macabre quality about these things because there's always destruction happening over here. The people getting killed, the people getting exploited, there are lands getting ravaged uh, because of you know industrialization of imperialism so the dance of death which is again there's a degree of carnivalesque about it so it's like almost like destruction which is so uh, absolutely destructive that it's almost comic in quality there's no there's nothing you can salvage out of it right so the, that destruction that death uh, goes hand in hand with trade so the quality of trade and imperialism it has a carnivalesque quality to it. It's, it has a grotesque quality to it. It's so greedy uh, that it's grotesque in quality, right? So there's a cannibalistic, grotesque quality about imperial trade, which Marlowe is emphasizing over here, and Conrad, of course, is trying to project that as an image of imperialism. Uh, there's a grotesque, carnivalesque, cannibalistic quality about trade, imperial trade, because it's never disconnected with death. It's never uh, distanced from death. It's always about death. It's always about destruction. It's about, always about the merry dance of death, the dance macabre, as uh, uh, technically we would call it. Okay, so the merry dance of death and trade goes on in a still and earthly atmosphere as of an overheated catacomb. So the whole idea, the, the tomb quality, the sepulchre quality is important over here. It's always about deadness, something sepulchre, something coffin-like. Uh, in quality and a coffin like quality, uh, it dramatizes the image of deadness, the intensity of deadness over here. All along the formless coast, bordered by dangerous surf, as if nature herself had tried to ward off intruders in and out of rivers, streams of death and life, whose banks were rotting into mud, whose waters, taken into slime, invaded the contorted mangroves. They seemed to writhe at us in the extremity of an important despair. So, you know, this particular. Uh, passage again very dense, very difficult, uh, and full of very difficult words, right, uh, thickened with slime, rotting into mud, uh, contorted mangroves. So, we find that what Mal is trying to describe is the density of death over here. And it all ends with a very important phrase important despair. Now, what is important? Something which doesn't have any you know, purpose, something which is completely you know, powerless in quality. Right? Important despair. It's a despair that you can do nothing about. Right? It's a despair that is completely exhausting in quality. There's no, nothing to be salvaged from the despair. There's no action uh, to be generated from that despair. And that, that is an important thing over here. Uh, and that is, again, connected to, to the whole idea of the Sisyphean quality of heart of darkness, about a uh, marvelous experience in heart of darkness. As someone who knows it, who sees it all, who sees imperialism as a dark, destructive, dangerous and greedy exploitative thing but nothing can be done about it right so important despair becomes an, an absolute annihilation of agency so to say as a complete uh, you know, decline in annihilation of agency systematic annihilation of agency the agency goes away uh, from the whole idea of imperialism so once you're inside as an imperialist there's nothing you can do uh, to salvage uh, or redeem any pride any glory any heroism at all 
Nowhere did we stop long enough to get a particularized impression, but the general sense of vague and oppressive wonder grew upon me. Again, a very important phrase, oppressive wonder. So the whole idea of bewilderment, the whole idea of astonishment over here, is not one of romanticized astonishment, not one of romanticized you know, wonder uh, or fascination, but it's something very oppressive about it, something very, very hard and difficult and, and, and repressive about this whole exercise over here. And at the same time, it's very, very vague. So you don't quite know what's oppressing you, you don't quite know what is bothering and torturing you, but at the same time, that oppressive wonder uh, grows in you organically. It sort of eats you up. And this is what I mean when I say this is cannibalistic quality of imperialism. Uh, it eats you up uh, as an activity, as an existential activity. It was like a weary pilgrimage among hints of nightmares, uh, among hints for nightmares. So, you know, it becomes a grotesque pilgrimage. It becomes a grotesque parody of the romantic quest for meaning, a romantic quest for the Holy Grail, for any kind of redemptive quality. Because the more you travel uh, in this particular experience, the more exhausted you get out of redemption, the more you realize uh, that it's, it's completely impossible, it's irredeemable uh, to a large extent. And that irredeemable quality grows upon you as you, grow, as you travel further. Right? So that becomes an important part of the experience at all, uh, you know, the whole idea of imperialism. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> and then we have another uh, uh, character who is introduced over here, Bamalo, uh, a seaman, uh, a, a captain of a particular steamer who is a Swedish person. Uh, and this is Malo's experience with that person. Her captain was a Swede, and knowing me for a seaman, invited me on the bridge. He was a young man, lean, fair, and morose. Again, the, the morose, the depressed, the depressed quality is important. It's almost something uh, melancholic about the whole experience over here. And I use the word melancholic in a Freudian sense because melancholia is a special kind of sadness. As some of you would know that when Freud talks about melancholia and mourning together, melancholia is that sadness which is generated or accompanied with a sense of the loss of the ego. You lose your sense of self-esteem. Uh, is that sadness which takes away your self-esteem. It takes away uh, an irredeemable quality that you have as an ego, as a person, as a subject. So melancholia is essentially about uh, the exhausting away of the subject's worth or the subject's value to itself. So you know, it's a production of valuelessness. It's a production of worthlessness. So melancholia is about the production of worthlessness, which is accompanied by sadness. So sadness and worthlessness put together uh, is what melancholia is in a Freudian, the classical Freudian sense. And we have that sense of melancholia very palpably present here as well in Heart of Darkness. Young man, lean, fair and morose, uh, with lanky hair and shuffling gait. So something very unhealthy, something very decadent, something very unhygienic uh, about this particular person, about all the people in Heart of Darkness, something very uh, sepulchre uh, or, or, or macabre or death-like about them. As we left the miserable little wharf, he tossed his head contemptuously at the shore. Been living there? He asked. I said, yes. Fine, Lord, these government jobs uh, are the not. He went on speaking English with great precision and considerable bitterness. It is funny what some people will do after a few francs a month. I wonder what becomes of that kind when it goes up country. I said to him, expected to see that soon. So, he exclaimed, he shuffled athward, keeping one eye ahead vigilantly. Don't be too sure, he continued. The other day, I took up a man who hanged himself on the road. He was a, he was a sweet too, hanged himself. Why in God's name, I cried. He kept on looking out watchfully. Who knows, the sun too much for him, or the country perhaps. Now, uh, I'll stop at this point today, but you know, I'll spend some time in this passage. So we have two white men you know, comparing the horror stories over here. So we have this Swedish person uh, telling Marlowe that if you go further up this country, if you go further up this heart of darkness, quote unquote heart of darkness, you find that you grow more and more insane, that you do things, you'll experience things, you believe in things which are completely quote unquote irrational. And that can make you mad, that can drive you to death. And we have an example of someone who actually, you know, hung himself, you know, so someone who killed himself, uh, presumably out of morbid despair. Now, this is the reason why Heart of Darkness is such a topical novel today, because we find that this kind of a white experience of despair, meaninglessness, you know, delusion, uh, or melancholia, the sense of worthlessness that you get out of sadness, is something which you get a lot uh, in Iraq one novels. So, for instance, there's a large literature emerging out of the American Iraq War. So, if you look at the Iraq War novels, the people who went, uh, the American soldiers who went to Iraq, when they came back, uh, there's a very famous novel called uh, uh, Yellow Birds by Kevin Powers, I think. Uh, if you read that novel, it's about the uh, PTSD veteran who came, comes back from the Iraq War. 
and it doesn't quite know how to tell the story, it doesn't quite know how to situate his own subject apropos the horrors he's experienced. And Heart of Darkness, in that sense, is one of the earliest novels about the horrors of the white man who goes on a greedy mission, who goes on an exploitative mission, who goes on a ravaging mission of imperialism. And in the process, uh, he f gets completely consumed up. Uh, there's something cannibalistic about the whole enterprise which eats him up existentially. And then we have all these white men talking to each other, uh, very depressed, very delusional, uh, you know, almost mad, uh, some, some suicidal, and essentially hollowed out. And this is one image that I will stop at in this lecture and will continue with the next lectures. But a sense of hollowness in Heart of Darkness is something which is very, very important. And that's something which you find in many Iraq War novels, uh, American Iraq War novels, when a white man, the white veterans come back from the Iraq War, the white soldiers come back from the Iraq War. Uh, they, they, they carry on, they extend the sense of hollowness, uh, which is essentially an exhausted ego. The ego gets completely exhausted, completely liquidated, completely shut down in that sense. And interestingly enough, when uh, T.S. Eliot wrote this very famous poem called Hollow Man, uh, which is one of the greatest works in modernist literature, uh, in the modernist poetry, we won't do that because we're doing fiction, we're doing novels and, and prose, but you know, it's worthwhile reading it. Uh, but the point is, the point I'm trying to make is, in that particular uh, poem, uh, The Hollow Man, he begins with an epitaph, and the epitaph is from Heart of Darkness, which is Mr. Coots, He Dead reference to Mr. Kutz from Heart of Darkness. So Heart of Darkness, uh, Conrad's Heart of Darkness becomes the, the, the allegory of hollowness uh, for modernism. It becomes an archetype uh, of hollowness and fiction for later modernist works. Uh, someone like T.S. Eliot to quote it, uh, to cite it, uh, to refer to it as the, the, the ur text, so to say, about hollowness is a very, very important thing. So, you know, Heart of Darkness, you know, you find all these unnamed melancholic characters, melancholic white men who talk to each other, uh, compare the horror stories, uh, um, show the scars to each other, so to say. Uh, they are very, very interestingly dialoguing with some of the recent literature on Iraq some of the recent literature on the Middle East written by uh, you know, people who either traveled or fought the wars or people who you know, fictionalized it in a different kind of frame. Uh, but it's essentially about melancholy, about hollowness, and about realizing that the mission, the political mission, whether it's a war against terrorism uh, or imperialism, whatever, is essentially a greedy, exploitative, cannibalistic enterprise. And this awareness of cannibalism, this knowledge of cannibalism is something which literally and existentially eats them up. As a result, they emerge as hollow people uh, who either kill themselves, commit suicide, or get killed existentially uh, in the sense that they come back uh, permanently enervated, permanently exhausted, permanently paranoid, and permanently living that horror. Uh, in modern parlance, we call them PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder. So they're permanently PTSD veterans. And this is what I mean when I say a lot of Iraq war literature deals with this kind of theme as well. So I'll stop at this point today and we'll continue with this on the next lectures. Thank you for your attention.